Welcome to Quarantine, our one hour math and science show hosted by Science Mom and Math Dad. We're excited to have you here today and I wanna say a quick welcome to those who are watching live and those who will be watching the replay. We're glad that you're here. A special shout out to Hannah from Virginia, Nate from Connecticut, LeBrian from North Carolina, Natalie from Michigan, and I'm seeing so many more comments coming in. Julie, Roseanne, Camden, Chelsea, hello everyone. We're happy to have you here. Now we are talking about genetics today and probability. And as we were getting our lesson ready, Math Dad and I both realized that this could easily be an entire week. Well, no, it could be a whole semester. We could talk about this for so long and we're so excited about it. In fact, if you look at the link for um, the Patreon notes, I think we have six or seven handouts there for you because we just, <laughs> we couldn't help ourselves. We're so excited about this topic. So quickly, let me share our schedule with you, especially for any of you who are new to quarantine so you know what we're going to be covering. So we have <clears throat> an art showcase and then a science lesson, a little trivia thing called fact or fiction, a math lesson, a mystery called what's in the bag and an engineering challenge. And then Math Dad likes to end with a little higher level math mystery at the end. And then we'll show a little bit more of the art. Every day we have an art prompt and an engineering challenge. And if you print out the notes, which are free and you can find them on Patreon, you have a little head start to see if you can figure out our fact or fiction and our mystery. So I'm excited to get into the art. Yes, I'm excited for this art too. I know that science mom Kristen, when she was picking the from the art submissions, had a hard time narrowing it down because there were so many fantastic new insects. So the art prompt was to design your own new insect and tell us what it would do to help planet Earth. So I'm going to share my screen now and bring up our art showcase. We had so much fun looking at the variety of insects. There were so many interesting and new and different type of, of insects that we found. So here we go. Ooh, they look like leaves. Yes, these do look like they are inspired by leaves. So great job here on the artwork. And then oh. look, Math Dad, stop singing that song. <laughs> I concur. I concur. <laughs> great artwork, you guys. I love the leaf inspiration. The electric okay. nutrient bug gives off nutrients. Very Ooh. useful. And great job here, Wyatt. The This bug, <laughs> the reason it got caught was because of the song. That song is interfering with things again. <laughs> it's, it's luring them in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so th this bug catches bad bugs, makes sure the food doesn't get wasted. Very useful. The flying spider ninja traps bad people with its web. Whoa. It's like a superhero bug. It I love it. Great work. <laughs> The eye mask and everything. Yeah, great work, Abdullah. <laughs> the birthday butterfly gives birthday surprises to everyone. Ishal, we love this one. It's fantastic. A great insect. And then the ladyfly, I believe. It fantastic coloring and stops things that are mean. Wonderful. A stinger. A water ant and a venom bot. And it's made out of metal and can eat dry ice. Oh, Santa. Ooh, fantastic. <laughs> Laser powers too, that's quite the insect. And then this one, his eyes glow in the dark, his head eats the bad bugs, he has got a thorax, I love that he's got all the parts too in his abdomen. Awesome bug here, great work. Waters the plants, yeah. Helps Ooh. get rid of bad bacteria, a beetle bee. <laughs> and only the females have stingers, stingers. great job, Marla, I love this one. Jaden. All right, so we've got clear water, so it's drinkable, so it's, it's actually it's cleaning clean the bug. water. Yeah. Oh, boy. yeah. This upsy rainbow is um, flies upside down as a rainbow, and when it lands, it pollinates 100 flowers at a time. So a super pollinator, I love it. <laughs> this one is the size of a rhino, and it drinks pollution. That would be pretty amazing. Whoa, yeah, a little scary too. But... The gladmer bug helps to absorb sunlight so it can see in the dark, and it glows. Great job, we Carissa. Walk on water. Yeah. Love that. And the poisonous elf beetle, it eats mosquitoes. Ooh, I have to say, I, I any, like that one. Yes, any bug that eats mosquitoes is a great bug, in my opinion. The snake snack bug loves to help the earth. It eats snakes that would bite us, and it, his poo goes into the ground and grows new trees. I love it. Good job, Maisie. And, and Noah's got a, a bee. A bee rhino. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> The millipede. This is this is wonderful. Helps the earth by eating dead animals and plants and making soil 
and it and it farts oxygen. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Great work. The lawnmower insect mows lawns for free if you can find him. <laughs> very useful. Great work, David. The very venomous four-eyed butterfly wasp infiltrates gardens and stings and eats bees and other pollinators. Ooh, so here we have like, we've had a lot of superhero bugs. This one's kind of like a super villain bug. Mm. I like it. Yeah, really, really nice proportions there. But it pollinates every time it moves to a flower. So it gets rid of bees and wasps, but it also does pollination. So maybe more of a neutral bug. I like it. Camilio. Fantastic. It makes people recycle. <laughs> <laughs> And the sharp act. Well, the shape the, act, is it? Oh, shape act. Yeah, because it's made of shapes by William. Eat the corona, coronavirus and make people better. I love it. The plant planter, whenever it sleeps, it makes plants w and trees. Wherever it steps. Oh, yeah. wherever it steps. I love it. <laughs> the zombie by Carter. <laughs> Crawls in your oh. ear, eats your brain. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the flurg bug can help blind people around the town and their house and do cooking and household chores. Oh, I want a fleur bug, Violet, that's fantastic. And it wears shoes too, I love it. <laughs> the ant lily, it's part ant, part lily, and it helps by growing plants and caring for plants. I love it, very nice. We've got a kegla insect, it turns things magical. Oh, I love it. And I love the three-dimensional aspect of this art project too, very nice. The golden wings. Helps keeping the planet clean with long hours. It takes trash and puts oh, in special anti-pollution. Long hook, but yeah. Oh, long hook. Very nice. Anti-pollution bins. I love it. A puffer puffer tree planting bug. Ooh, and I love the life cycle here. We've got egg to larva to beetle. Very nice. The squiggler. It squiggles around watching the bees. They love honey, so they watch the bees. Very nice. Good job, Ember. And Braden. So he's got a. Uh, a honster. It will help bees get the get the pollen. Nice. Faster so they can make more honey. And Addison drew a great super bug flies to help and heal people. I love it. And then we have an elephant ear. Ooh, it stings animals. Nice. That can feed on plants. Feed on plants. And so it's protecting plants like a plant guardian. And a water. This bug helps water plants. I love it. Great job on the artwork, you guys. And we will have more of the art showcase at the end. Um, I love the creativity and the variety that we had with those prompts. So real quick, by way of review, yesterday we talked about cells and how amazing it is that every living thing from the tiniest bacteria to the largest animal and tree and plant are made up of cells. They're kind of the unit of life. And we have a membrane on the outside, a nucleus, and then on the inside, of course, we have DNA. And if you are a small little bacteria cell, you don't have a nucleus, you just have the DNA down in the middle. And then we mentioned archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, the different types of cell. And for painting with a scientist, we did a little painting lesson afterwards with it. And I also showed you guys my attempt to make yogurt, that if you heat up milk and then cool it down to a nice warm temperature and add your, your yogurt start, the lactobacillus, this friendly bacteria, will turn the milk into yogurt. And my yogurt yesterday was a little bit of a fail, but I made another batch and it turned out much better. And then tomorrow, when we talk about microbes and germs, I will show you results of several different yogurt making experiments. But today, we are learning about DNA. DNA is fascinating, and it is the material that makes our cells know what to do, that tells them what to do. And to show you a little bit more about DNA today, I'm going to extract DNA from a strawberry and from a banana and show you exactly what it looks like. So I'm going to ask Math Dad to be my helper and move my camera, move our laptop over here. All right. And maybe if we can set it on top of a block just right here so it's a nice close view. I'm going to bring you over here to the table so that you get a little closer view and you can see exactly what's going on with our science experiment. So I have a strawberry in a bag and we're going to squish it up to get it just as soupy as possible. I'm gonna give these two strawberries to Math Dad and let him continue squishing those over here for a minute. And then I also have a banana, and I apologize if anyone's grossed out because this banana looks a little bit more like something rotten than a banana, but bananas, you cannot get DNA from them unless you freeze them first. If you don't freeze them, then you're gonna smoosh up your banana and try everything that we're doing with our DNA extraction, and it's not gonna work at all. 
So that's why this banana looks disgusting and brown because I had it in the freezer and then I thought it and brought it out. And the reason why we have to freeze our banana is because the DNA, remember, it's inside the cell. And it's not only inside the cell, it's inside the nucleus of the cell. So there are two membranes protecting that DNA. And if we wanna get it out, we have to break open those membranes. And the strawberries, they break open pretty easily because of some special um, enzymes. Those are little proteins that just happen to be in the strawberry. And so if you just squish your strawberry, the DNA will come out of those membranes pretty easily. But the bananas, you gotta freeze them first to make that happen. So now that we have squished up our, oh, math dad squished the bag too hard and it looks like we have a popper. Did you pop the bag? I think it just opened to the top. Oh, okay. Mmm, strawberry. Now that we have squished up our bags, we're ready to add our extraction solution. And I'll tell you, if you feel like, science mom, you're going through this a little too fast, I do have an entire video called How to Extract DNA from a Strawberry, and then one called DNA Extraction Explained. And I'm going to update our Patreon post with links to both of those, and you can check out those for more details. But here's what we're gonna do next. So we have our squished up strawberries and our squished up banana, and we need to add a little bit of salt and a little bit of soak to them. So this right here is our extraction solution, and it's just a little bit of water, soap, and salt. And now I'm gonna take a scoop and put it in to each of these bags. You wanna help me out, Math Dad, and open them up? So scoop of soapy, salty water into this strawberry bag and into the other one. And now into the banana. And then just like we did before, we're going to mix these around a little bit more. And the reason why we have two strawberry bags is because I wanted to do a simple experiment and see if the rubbing alcohol that we salted out a couple weeks ago, if that one would work. If we would be able to get our DNA extraction to work with that rubbing alcohol that had extra salt in it and food coloring from a previous experiment. So that's why we have two strawberry bags. And I want to add, now that we've mixed this a little bit, I'm gonna add one more tablespoon of our extraction solution and mix it just a little more, and then we're ready to put it into our containers. And if we're lucky, we're gonna get DNA. And especially to those who have not tried this before, I'm curious, what do you think the DNA will look like? So if all of the DNA that is inside the strawberry clumps together, what is it gonna look like and how much is there gonna be? Is there gonna be just like the tiniest little speck are we actually gonna be able to see it and pull it out? So give me a couple predictions in the chat and then we're gonna try it. So it's kind of tricky to get any rubbing alcohol. Well, most of the stores are I, out right now. I will say we had a hard time finding rubbing alcohol. And if you are having a hard time finding rubbing alcohol, you might be able to use regular alcohol, ethanol, if it's extra concentrated. And so you, you'd probably want to salt it out just like we did in our chemistry section. Or you can also just bookmark this experiment for later and say, you know what, in a couple months when we can find rubbing alcohol, then we'll try it. So here is our banana in this jar and now it's gonna start dripping through. I've got a coffee filter set up right here. And then we're gonna put our strawberry in and Matt Dad, if you could go grab that green rubbing alcohol from the other room. So, and I see a couple people, um, Ember says that they've done this before, and Jacqueline says it's like a long blob. We've got a few predictions. Ooh, and then um, Anna would like to know what DNA is. We'll talk about that as soon as we extract it. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. But DNA is something that you have inside all of your cells, and it is what tells your cells what to do. <clears throat> so you might have noticed that the cells in your skin, the cells on your skin here or inside your cheek are very different than the cells that make up your eye. And the cells that make up your hair are different than the cells that make up a fingernail. And those differences are all caused by DNA. The DNA is kind of like the plans for the architect. And if you want to know how to build something, a living thing, you need to have those instructions, and those instructions are found in DNA. And I'll tell you exactly what it is as soon as we do our extraction. We need to let this 
soak through and drip to the bottom. This juice that is coming out has a lot of different things in it. <clears throat> Excuse me, it has sugars, because you know that strawberries and bananas are both sweet, right? So they have sugars in there. We have sugars dripping down, and we have little pieces of cell membranes that got broken up by all our squishing, and we have pieces of DNA that are dripping down too. But right now, it's all mixed together in one big slushy mixture, and we want to separate it out. Until you do that, we're going to use rubbing alcohol. But first, and I'm going to invite Math Dad to come over here and sit, sit here with me. <clears throat> we want to squeeze out just a little bit more juice because if we just let these sit, I'll try scooting back just a little bit more. If we just let these sit here, then all of the liquid will come out, but it takes about 15 minutes. And we're, because we're live streaming, we're in a little bit more of a hurry. We don't want to just sit here for 15 minutes. And so very carefully, I'm going to take this little coffee filter and I'm going to gently squeeze it <clears throat> to get a little bit of that DNA out. That sounds plausible. Yep. And the, the trick here is you don't want to squeeze too hard because if you squeeze too hard, you will break your coffee filter. And if you break your coffee filter and all of the chunky stuff in here goes into your solution, then you're going to have to start over. So really gently, just give a little bit of pressure so that it drips down in. <clears throat> Math Dad, what do you know about DNA? I know that it comes from the nucleus of the cell, which is something we talked about last time. That's right. As deoxyribonucleic acid. Well, let me ask you a question. Does everything that is alive have DNA? Yeah. DNA or RNA. RNA is another type of genetic material that's very similar to DNA. And yes, everything that we know of that is alive has either DNA or RNA. I also know that the DNA is a double helix shape. That's right. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we make our, our craft. But how much DNA are we going to find inside a banana or a strawberry? Because this is, we have a half a banana that I'm squeezing the juice out of in this one. And in here we have a strawberry, a pretty large one. And this one, there was two smaller strawberries. So when we pull our DNA out, do you think we'll have, you know, just like a pea size amount of DNA? Or do you think we'll have a long strand of DNA? I'm seeing I mean, a couple it, predictions. It has to be smaller track. than the original strawberry. That's true. So we couldn't have a, an amount of DNA that was bigger than the strawberry, for sure. And now we'll just kind of set this right over there, and I'll squeeze out the last. If you have a prediction, put it in the put it in the chat. Um, Ember asked, "Do plants have DNA?" Yes, all plants have DNA. All animals have DNA, and then viruses and bacteria have DNA as well. And you guys can see that our strawberry is a little bit more liquidy than our banana because the bananas have so much starch in them. And we're going to pour on rubbing alcohol next. And when we pour on the rubbing alcohol, all of the DNA that is in this juice here is going to clump together. We call that precipitating. If you have something that is in solution just floating around and then it clumps together, then it's called precipitating because just like when snow precipitates and you see like snow or rain falling down, it's kind of the same thing. You have it clumped together and it gets heavier and then often it will fall down or it will just clump together in a way where you can see it. Now, we're ready for the my favorite step of adding the rubbing alcohol. This looks really cool and I hope that you guys will be able to see this well and I think I think what might be best is if we get another one of our blocks and we set these up a little bit higher. Can you grab me a block, Math Dad? Small. Yeah. So we are going to set up this block here. We're good. And now we're going to add our rubbing alcohol. So into this jar here, I'm going to add the rubbing alcohol that we used during our chemistry lesson when we added salt and increased the concentration of the rubbing alcohol just to see if it'll work or if the food coloring will interfere. So we're going to pour in about an equal amount of rubbing alcohol to our liquid. And then just let it sit there for a minute. So is that one more concentrated? So this one started oh. out as 50% rubbing alcohol, but because we added salt and salted it out, it should be more concentrated right now. Whether it is all the way up to 91% or not, we're not entirely sure. We will find out. And now we have our 91% rubbing alcohol that we're going to put into our next two containers.
And then while it's precipitating, I'm going to check the chat to see if anyone else made a guess as to how much DNA we're going to find in here. Is it going to be like a pea size amount? Is it going to be, you know, half the size of a strawberry? How much is there going to be in there? I am seeing a couple good comments about DNA and a couple great questions about RNA. And so I'm going to ask Math Dad to make a guess. So pretend like you've never seen this before, Math Dad. How much DNA would you think there was going to be? Well, I mean, there are a lot of cells, but they're so darn tiny. Like I, I, I would, would not have guessed there was very much. Like I, just barely enough so that you could detect it. Just barely enough to see. So I'm going to dip a toothpick in and pull out all the DNA because now we're starting to get enough that it's clumped together enough that I can pull it out. And the first time I did this, the first time I saw this, I was amazed by the amount of DNA too because there was so much of it. And there's so much because it is so long and strand-like. So here we go. First from our jar with the green rubbing alcohol, I'm going to reach in and just stick this toothpick underneath our DNA and pull it out. And you, this long kind of white stringy substance here that you can see, that is the DNA. It almost looks kind of like a Kind of like a booger. It's a little gross. Ew. Oh, and some of it. There we go. <laughs> and it's... with our salted out rubbing alcohol, it's not sticking together quite as well as it normally does. But I still got a pretty good amount. And that's all DNA from that strawberry. Next, we will do the other strawberry here. And we're also getting a good amount of DNA in here. I don't think with the orientation of our camera, it'll be possible for me to tip this and show you. But if you watch the Science Mom Extracts DNA from a Strawberry video on my YouTube channel, you'll see a couple good close-ups where you can see all of this DNA. And there we go. This one's holding together much better than our salted out rubbing alcohol did. I think probably because our rubbing alcohol here was more concentrated. And look at all of that. Isn't that amazing? Now, one of my favorite things to do is to put this back in that plastic bag that we were squishing the strawberry in. If we have it rinsed out and put it in and we just squish it out, you can see how strand-like and filamentous it is. I'll ask Math Dad, if you don't mind, if you can grab me a plastic bag and bring that back in just a minute, I'll, I'll show everyone that it really is super strand-like. And that's because DNA is a polymer. A necklace is a polymer too. If you put a bunch of beads together, you get a necklace and it's just a strand of repeating units. So with a necklace, the bead is your unit. And if you add a whole bunch of beads together on a string, you've got a necklace, that's your polymer. With DNA, a nucleotide is our unit. And if you put a bunch of nucleotides together, you get DNA. Now let's try our banana. So with the banana, because our liquid is sort of clearish, it's not quite as easy to see, but we also got some nice DNA in our banana. Whoa. And I can see the clumps here, but it's not attaching to the to the toothpick super well. So there is our there is our banana DNA. I think last time I tried the banana, it didn't work at all. But is that just because it wasn't frozen? Because it wasn't frozen. If you don't freeze your banana, you won't get any DNA. It won't work at all. So now if I sort of squish out some of this DNA, if you look really closely, you can see that there it looks like there are millions and millions of little threads. And if you put this under a microscope, you're not actually going to see a double helix if you have a microscope at home, but you will see even more threads because this is all made of long, super long strands of DNA. Well, why won't you see a double helix? Because your home at home microscope isn't powerful enough. This, the double helix that you see when you see models of DNA, it is so, so small. We're talking about like on the level of atoms and, you know, tiny molecules small. And so when you're looking at a D this DNA here with an at-home microscope, you will get a lot closer. You'll get more magnified, but it won't be close enough to actually see the helix, but you will see lots and lots of strands. What about RNA? Is that RNA, that that's a great question. And we'll come to the whiteboard for just a second to finish our, our science lesson. And I'll draw just a little bit more about DNA. So excuse that noise right there. So real quick, just to review, DNA is a polymer and our word of the day is nucleotide because nucleotides, nucleotides, those are the units that make up DNA. 
And in DNA, we have four different types of nucleotides. And just for fun, I'm gonna draw them as a circle and a little kind of curvy box as a triangle and a kind of upside down triangle box. We have four types of nucleotides in DNA. That's not actually true, we kind of have kind of have five if you include RNA, but for sake of simplicity, let's just say we have four types in DNA and they pair together. So you can only have one type with the other and then this one will only go with this one. And if you try and match them up like this, then it's like error, error does not compute. They like to match up a certain way. And that's what allows DNA to give us information. So it's essentially an alphabet with just a few letters in it. And then the combination of those letters gives you different um, different products. And so for example, let's let's go back to our banana and our strawberry. One of the chemicals in the banana that gives it such a distinct smell is, um, is actually the main flavoring in Laffy Taffy. And I can't remember off the top of my head. I should have looked at my looked at my little my little list, but I think it's I think it's does anyone know in the chat? Did anyone look at my my handout? I'll have to look it, I'll have to look it up later. But anyway, this chemical that, that smells like a banana, it comes from a certain segment of DNA. Isoamyl acetate. Thank you, Math Dad. Isoamyl acetate. So if you have isoamyl acetate, it smells exactly like banana laffy taffies. This is a chemical that I made one time in our, an organic chemistry lab, and the smell was so strong that when I came back home to my apartment, my roommates immediately was, said, why does it smell like banana laffy taffy? And I said, because that's the chemical that we made in my OCHEM lab today. So if you make isoacetate, tell me that name again. Isoamyl acetate. Isoamyl, isoamyl acetate there's a certain string of DNA that has all the instructions to, boom, make this little molecule. And this little chemical smells exactly like banana Laffy Taffies. And if you took this little piece of DNA and you put it into a strawberry, you could actually get strawberries that would smell like banana Laffy Taffies because they would have this molecule and this molecule is what gives that smell. So everything that is happening in your body is a result of these interactions of information in DNA being turned into chemicals and proteins and enzymes. It's really cool. And like we said before, we are so excited about this topic, we could easily do a whole week on genetics. And so we're trying to just kind of give you like a, a nice quick introduction and then and then we'll move on so that, so that we make sure that we end on time. But that is my lesson on DNA. I hope you enjoyed seeing the DNA come out of a strawberry. And I bet a lot of you guys were surprised by just how long and stringy it was. There was a lot of DNA in that strawberry. One of the reasons why the strawberry had so much DNA is that strawberries have a lot of extra copies. They don't just have one copy of their DNA. They have, I believe, eight. I'm pretty sure they're octoploid. They have eight. You and I, we have two copies. Wow. I remember I was very surprised when I first saw how much DNA there was in a strawberry. Who would have thought? Yes, tons, uh, tons. All right, so up next we have our fact or fiction, which uh, I, I haven't read yet, but I'm very curious. So our fact or fiction facts today have to do with DNA. So fact number one, a seedless watermelon is made by crossing two types of watermelons that have a different number of chromosomes. Ah, so... Yeah, if you cross them with a different number of chromosomes, they wouldn't be able to reproduce and they wouldn't have seeds. Uh, yeah, not seeing in the chat yet, but I, no, I, it's gotta be true. It's, it's true, that's exactly how you would make a seedless watermelon. It is true. Every living thing has DNA or RNA and seedless watermelons are no different. But if you have a watermelon that has two copies of it, each of its genes, then the, and it crosses with another one that has two copies, they each give one copy and then the offspring has two. But if you have a watermelon that has two copies of every gene and another watermelon that has four copies of every gene, then when they, you cross those two watermelons together, you get one from this one and two from this one. They go together and then it's like, mayday, mayday, odd number does not compute. We can't make seeds. That's what happens in your seedless watermelon. I'm, I'm almost more surprised that it's even possible for the cross to take place. Yeah. It's, it is kind of cool. Plants, plants are kind of amazing with their DNA that you can double the number of genes in a plant. And a lot of plants are like, oh, cool, we got extra DNA. Animals are not so adaptable when it comes to doubling the number of genes and genetic material they have. Mm. Next one. 
A, a mule is a cross between a female donkey and a male horse. Well, yeah, that's what a mule is, right? All right. Anyone in the <laughs> chat want to help him out? Are you telling me I'm wrong? It's, it's, <laughs> you are wrong. <laughs> so no, Everybody says it's true. Um, a hinny is a cross between a female donkey and a male horse. A mule is a cross between a male donkey and a female horse. Really? Really. And mules are much more common because if the horse is the female, then that's a bigger animal and it's easier for that horse to carry the pregnancy. If the mule, or sorry, if the donkey is the is the mother, then it's a little bit harder. So hinnies are less common than donkeys. I've never heard of a hinny. <laughs> that's, that's why I picked this one because I thought it would be really fun if Math Dad, who grew up on a farm, got this one wrong. So <laughs> like, yes. So I, I remember the Hogle Zoo in Salt Lake City had this liger half lion, half tiger. And I do remember that it mattered. I, I can't even remember whether the mother was the tiger or the lion, but if you did it the other way around, instead of a liger, it was a tigon. Yeah, yeah. It, some, sometimes with hybrids, it really does matter what the, how, how it works with that, that cross. And donkeys and hinnies that are, and sorry, mules and hinnies, that's one of those cases where it does matter a lot. So <laughs> a donkey is a cross between a male, sorry, a hinny is a cross between a female donkey and a male horse. That's why that one's false. All right. All right, fact number next. If you swallow gum, it takes your body seven years to digest it. <sighs> okay, I, I've heard this one. I've heard it stay there forever because your body can't digest it. Um, the, I don't know if your body actually can digest it, but I, I don't, you pass it through, right? It, um, seven years. I'm seeing that, lots that, of good responses in the chat. Fall, okay, it's, it's clearly false. Yes, good know. job. Sabrina, I don't know, there's a lot of truths there too. So. <laughs> Sabrina, Cole, Liam, you guys have got it right. It is false. So if you swallow gum, it is not going to stay in your body for seven years. Gum is not digestible, but so are a lot of other things you eat, like um, celery. There's a lot of celery <laughs> that's not digestible. It is, it's fiber that just goes right through. And you want to have a certain amount of fiber in your diet because if you everything you ate was 100% digestible, then you wouldn't have a good way of getting rid of stuff that your body didn't want to have. So gum, not digestible, but it doesn't stay for seven years. It will pass right through. Next, tongue rolling is genetic. If you have the right DNA for it, you can do it. Otherwise, you can't, and no amount of practice will change the fact. So show us a tongue roll, math dad. Roll your tongue, and if I try to do it, eh, I, I can't. I can't do it. All right, so I remember as a kid, my mom would be bragging about it. Look, I can roll my tongue. And all of us kids were like, yeah, mom, big deal. <laughs> <laughs> we can all do we, it, We can too. do it, too. Um, so is, the, is that a genetic trait? Um, oh, gosh. I, I don't know. <sighs> yes, it's, it's, it's genetic. This one is a great one because it's actually false, but it is a very common misconception, and you'll find it as an example in a lot of old genetic textbooks. So it was disproven pretty early on in the 1950s. There was a famous researcher who said, aha, tongue rolling is a good example of a genetic trait. If you have the genes for it, demonstrate, you can do it. And if you don't have the genes for it, you can't. But another researcher just a few years later in the 1950s said, well, we should be able to prove this with a study. And he looked at identical twins and said, if this is a genetic trait, identical twins, since they have the same DNA, they should either share the trait or not share the trait. And he found that a lot of them were split, where some identical twins could do it and others couldn't. And then he said, huh, if this is a learned trait, then people who practice it should be able to learn it. And he got a sample of a lot of people, I think 100 or so people, who could not roll their tongues and told them to practice every day for 15 minutes. And a lot of them, after just one week of practice, could roll their tongues. That, that's kind of cool. I had something similar happen where somebody challenged me to see if I could turn my tongue over. And if at first I could only do it on one side, but then I practiced and I could just, so. Turn your tongue over. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna gross out people in yeah. the chat. But I mean, I think like flaring your nostrils. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I assume that that's just something you practice, you actually figure out, all right, what muscles involved are there, what, what's what's happening, and then you can do it once you've actually figured it out. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of things like that are acquired they're things that we learn how to do. They're not things that we just have or don't have. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. After our, and I did see a couple of questions in the chat about um, our schedule and our format today. It is one hour, but after our one hour show, there'll be about a 10 minute break and I'll be back with painting like with a scientist if you want to continue. 
um, we have a math lesson now. So okay. it's time for probability. All right. So last time we talked about how to deal with probabilities when basically we had to multiply sequential probabilities and that gave us our total probability. Today I'm so gonna... let's say that just a little bit simpler for, for any younger kids. So if you have like a 50% chance of something and a 50% chance of something else happening, multiply them, that's your total chance. So that's what sequential probability Well, yeah, probability if two things means. are happening back to back. So be, the example I was going to give, if we flip a coin twice, there are two possible outcomes. We could either get a heads or a tails for the first time. And then I'm going to branch it again. For the second flip, we could get a heads or a tails. And now as I travel from left to right here, I see all the possible things that could happen. I could get heads, 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 tails, 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 or tails, heads. All right. And in this case, I'm just going to put a one half on each of these because that's the probability of going along each branch. So then, ultimately, what we get is the probability of getting a heads heads. So I might write this P of H H. So I just do one half times one half, and we get one fourth. The probability of heads tails, one half times one half also one-fourth. The probability of tails tails, one-half times one-half is one-fourth. And then the probability of tails heads is, no surprise, one-half times one-half is one-fourth. So that one's a, a little bit boring in the sense that the same numbers just kept showing up the entire time. So instead, I've got a slightly more exciting example here. And where did my bowl go? All right, here in my bowl, I have five marbles. I've got two greens, I've got two yellows, and a red. Let me just write that up here. I've got two greens, two yellows, and one red. Oh, or too high. Okay, try that again. Two greens, two yellows, one red. All right, and I'm going to pull one marble out and I'm not going to replace it. And then I'm gonna pull another one out and see how do we find the probabilities of all the possible outcomes in that scenario? Well, in that case, when we start here, there are three things that could happen. I could either get a green, I could get a yellow, or I could get a red for my first ball. Then, if I got a green first, well, then there's still three possibilities green, yellow, red. I could get a yellow first, and that would leave me with three possibilities. Green, yellow, red. Or if I got a red first, there would actually only be two possibilities, either green or yellow, because there weren't any more reds to draw from. All right, so once I've laid out the tree, I can just label the branches with their probability. So all together, since there were two out of five were green, it's a two-fifths chance of getting green. Similarly, there was a two-fifths chance of getting a yellow. And then for red, there was only a one in five chance because I only had one red marble. Okay, now once I've already taken a green, now there's four marbles left. And in that case, only one out of the four is green, two out of the four are yellow, and one out of the four is red. If I've got a yellow first, then two out of four are green, one out of four would be yellow, and one out of four would be red. And if I took a red first, uh, two out of four are green, and two out of four are yellow. And by drawing this probability tree, I'm now able to trace the, all the possible probabilities. So for example, if I wanted to know the, the probability of getting a green, then a red, Oops, the probability of green, red, that one's gonna be figured out just by following these branches. I see a two fifths followed by a one fourth. So that's two fifths times one fourth, which will work out to be one out of 10. And this same trick would work to find the probability of reaching any end conclusion. And this, we can get a lot more complicated with this. We could. Yeah, I ask a lot, large, large variety of questions, but it all boils down to figuring out this probability tree and you just multiply along the branches that lead to the outcome that you are trying to figure out. 
So that's our quick probability lesson for today. It's pretty cool to be able to see all of the the outcomes in a in a tree drawing. It I is like that. Yeah, they don't they don't fit. Uh, could, couldn't do a much bigger example on this board and still have it be readable. But. Now our drawing prompt for tomorrow is a fun one. I'm going to show that real quick before we go on to our engineering challenge. Our drawing prompt prompt is to make your own wacky Punnett square. And again, I totally recognize <clears throat> that we did not talk about Mendel or Punnett squares today, and that we we made the mistake of just being like genetics, so cool. Here's all this stuff, and gave you guys a whole bunch of handouts. But we, we, we will revisit this topic on another day. We definitely will. We could do a whole entire week on genetics. But there is a handout that will guide you through where if you pick something, some type of trait. So for example, in this little square here, the trait is the color of an alien. And it can be either green or purple. Then our little handout that we have on the Patreon post will show you how to assign what trait you see. And you can make a small four by four Punnett square, or you can make a big one. We have two handouts for each one. And did, we made a video already on this particular topic. Is that and, included? Yes, in the and that's included post? too. So you can watch that video that will tell you more about Punnett squares. So now it's time for the engineering challenge. You ready for this math, Dad? What about what's in the bag? Oh, what's in the bag and then the engineering challenge. It's a good thing we have an outline. That's right. All right. What's in the bag? They fill me up and empty me almost every day. It's a garbage. It's not a garbage, but that's a good guess. It's if, a tummy. Nope, it's not a tummy. That's a good guess, too. If, you, if I raise my arm, I work the opposite way. <sighs> raise my arm, it works the opposite way. Mm-hmm. I don't know, like a tractor bucket or something? It's not a tractor bucket. Jane's got it. What? A mailbox? It's a mailbox. It's a mailbox. <laughs> I probably would have been here all day trying to guess it. <laughs> Thanks for bailing him out. Yeah, he needed yeah. some help on that one. It is a mailbox. <laughs> and now for our engineering challenge, we're going to try and build a model of DNA. So I'm going to turn our laptop so that you have a view of our table here. And Math Dad has candy. He's going to try and build his model out of candy. I have markers and duct tape. And I printed out one of my DNA worksheets that you will find on the Patreon page. And I'm going to make my model be molecular. It'll be accurate with a molecular diagram of each of the nucleotides, which I think is quite awesome and I'm very excited about. Man. All right. Mine's gonna be tastier, that's that's for sure. And that's, that's what we really care about. In fact, my kids were super excited that I was going to get candy. So, oh wait, you get candy too? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> right, I've got these gumdrop like candies here, spice drops. And, and I will say, I did just post this morning I posted the links for tomorrow's lesson, which is on germs. And so if you go to patreon.com slash science mom, the very first post that you'll see is a post with a handout on germs. And I'll throw that banner up real quick, just in case anyone who's new watching doesn't know where to go to find the worksheets. And then the second post down that um, says, you know, DNA, that one has all of the worksheets for today's activity. So Math Dad is building his model of DNA out of oh whoops I ate one <laughs> out of gummy bears or no gumdrops and licorice. That's right. And I'm putting mine together out of actual nucleotides that are color coded. DNA is delicious. Not many people know this. <laughs> in in real life, I don't know that it would really have that much of a flavor. I would say that you could try some of the DNA we took out of the strawberry, but since it was um, precipitated in alcohol, I think it would taste pretty bad. Isopropyl alcohol is Ooh. not not edible. Are there other other ways of getting DNA out? Um, any type of alcohol will work. So you could use ethyl alcohol, but then I don't recommend eating that either if you're under the age of 18. So I don't think we have very many good options to evaluate the test, the taste. You, you could try rinsing it in water super well. I don't know. So, so when you were working in a lab, were you actually pulling out DNA? Yeah, and we did DNA. Testing it? We did. We did DNA extraction all the time, but we did not use the strawberry method. Um, we we used a different method, but the, the basic idea is pretty much the same. 
you're going to break open the cells and release the DNA from that inner membrane. And then you add things at the end that make it clump together. It's pretty much same basic idea, just a different, different process. Yeah. We used liquid nitrogen to break open our cells because like when you get them super frozen and then you grind them, then they, they break apart really well. So oh, so if you're at home and you have liquid nitrogen, why don't you just uh, get it out that way? Well, that's You asked what we did in the lab. That's yep. what we did. Oh, that's cool. Now, if I wanted to take this up a level with my engineering project, I would definitely put cardboard on the back and then I would cut in the middle so that these could sort of rotate around. But because, because we're sort of short on time with our engineering challenge, I'm just going sort of simply. Mm -hmm. I'm going to grab my scissors real fast. Whoops. All right, Math Dad, you've got like one more minute. What? You can't rush, genius. I'm an artist. I'm going to start sort of doing my cutting here so that these can rotate. Oh. Poke, poke, poke the gumdrops. Put them together nicely. It's Ooh. a model of DNA. That reminds me of another song I know. Do, 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 do. Nope, nope. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. Boom, boom. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. Didn't boom. you see in the art there are other people who get that stuck in their head too, and they're saying, you're "Stop, welcome. Math Dad, you're, stop." You're, you're, you're welcome. Glad I could be of assistance to you. All right, look at this. It's starting to rotate. Isn't uh -huh. it lovely? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Ah, mine's not rotating very much. Not all of us could be superstars. <laughs> Apparently, you have to space them out correctly. Geometry's hard. <laughs> Geometry can be challenging. <sighs> One more piece of tape. Ooh, we have a request for a nice. Uh, and I will say, if you have engineering requests or challenges that you would like to see us to, please let us know because we have we have about half of them planned out for next week. But right now, I'm looking for more great ideas. So if anyone has a great engineering challenge idea, I want to hear about it and send it to me, and we might we might use it. So all right, we need to declare victory here. All right, let me get, get this guy up a little bit closer here. So, yeah, it's supposed to be a double helix winding around itself. And, yeah, in the licorice is really bendy. So if I, when I sat this down, it just laid down flat. But me, if I had one of those big super ropes. With was, a little help, maybe you could. And you'll yeah. notice that he has purple always matching with green and yellow always matching with red because our nucleotides really are picky about who they go with. All right, tell us in the chat which one you like better because mine has the chemical structures of the actual nucleotides, which is awesome. Yeah, that's the, just delicious as can be. I'm sure and, the and chat has, will love that. And as duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm checking the chat. It looks like Math Dad is the winner. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we knew this would happen in advance. <laughs> Of course, yeah, that is of, of course, the candy um, <laughs> DNA structure is going to win over the the one that has the chemical formulas. That's right. <laughs> All right, we're gonna bring up our schedule real quick just to remind you guys where we're at. So we did our engineering challenge, and now it's time for the answer to the math mystery from yesterday. And Math Dad has another math mystery for today. So I'm going to turn the view around and turn it over to Math Dad. But before we do. Um, I want to give a special shout out to someone who totally got yesterday's math mystery right. And I guess maybe what I should do is, um, oh, our cord's caught there a bit. Maybe what I should do is have Math Dad tell you the answer, and then I'll show you how someone got it completely right. So Math Dad, explain it. Did they write out all the possibilities? The all right, so let's, let's see if we can figure out the answer to yesterday's math mystery, which was, in how many ways can we rearrange the letters in the word banana and it had to be recognizable so distinguishable ways so just swapping the two ends 
doesn't actually give us a new arrangement. All right, and our trick for doing this was pretend they were all different letters. So in that case, there would be six choices for the first option times five options for the second letter, four times three times two times one. So we call that six factorial. But then we had to divide by whatever factor we've overcounted. So there were two n's there. So the number of ways of rearranging those are just two ways. So two times one. Okay, so that takes care of us double counting the ends. But with the a's, there are three of those. So we could rearrange those in three times two times one different ways. Uh oh. So this, we divided by this number, and that allows us to deal with the over counting, the, the double counting things. All right, so then we're going to actually crunch this number out. What does that equal? Five times four times three. That's going to actually just be 60. There are 60 ways, distinguishable ways, of rearranging letters in banana. And I, I hope you guys tried to see how many ways you could rearrange the letters in your own name. And then I want to give a shout out real quick to Sanjana. And apologies if I mispronounce your name. If it's Sanjana, tell me. Because look, 420 ways to rearrange the letters in their name, and they also were completely correct with banana. So, awesome yep. job. Yep. Nicely done. So it's, it's kind of a fun problem, and it turns out to relate to a lot of different ideas that uh, we're going to see, or actually some of which we've already encountered. All right, so to talk about the new challenge, I just want to mention when we roll two dice, Turns out there are multiple possibilities. And there, there are board games that deal with this, like things like Monopoly or Settlers of Catan, where you roll two dice and you look at their sum. And the possible sums, you get a two up through a 12, but they're not all equally likely. And that's where you can't just count the possible outcomes. You have to do some figuring, maybe use a probability tree. But how do we actually find the probability of each outcome? I don't know, maybe you guys already know. What's the most likely roll you're going to get as the sum of two dice? So let me know in the chat if you already have a good sense for that. But here is one, one way of, of finding that. So the first die could be one, two, three, four, five, six. The second die could be a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And David says seven is your most likely. So, yeah, yep, yep, the chat near, knows what they're talking about. You've, near and you've played your and board games. Say seven. That, that's right. So I'm going to list out, there are 36 possible pairs. Well, we could get a two if we add those, or three, four, five, six, or seven. And then it's actually not that hard to write out all the possible sums here. So four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> I can do this, I can do this. Eight, nine, 10, 11, nine, 10, 11, or a 12. So what we'll see is there's only one way to get a 12. That's if you roll a six and a six, but the number that showed up the most was the, the sevens, so down this main diagonal. So your probability of rolling a seven, it turns out it's six out of the 36, which is one out of every six. And you could use that to find the probability of rolling any of the, the possible values. Now comes the question that I want to pose as your challenge problem. And this is a tricky problem because it puts everything together that we've done in the last two days. So <clears throat> Here, here's the question. What is the probability of rolling? I said, I want to make sure I do this right. Uh, a sum of 10 on three consecutive rolls. And is, it, is that more likely than rolling four consecutive sevens? Ooh. Do you think you would know how to answer that one? Boy, I, so I, I want to, I'm not going to look at this math dad solution. I'm going to see if I can figure out this one because this one is going to be challenging for me. 
And if it's challenging for science mom, then you know, especially if you are one of our kids watching and you could do this, like super high five. That's awesome. So my my hint is maybe there's a probability tree involved, or that that's one possible approach that you could take to this problem. But yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have to to think because even if you could draw out the probability tree, you still have to list the right probabilities. Awesome. Thank you. Whoop, and sorry for blinding you with the lights as we went around the opposite direction oh, as yeah. we normally do. Our cord got tangled. Thank you, Math Dad. And now we are have time for just one or two. Q&A real fast, and then we are going to do a second art showcase. But let me remind you real quick, in case you are not hanging around for our art sh showcase and want to get going, let me show you what our art prompt is for today so, and what our engineering challenge is. Somebody asked, what does consecutive mean? That just means in a row. So if you rolled it just three times, what are the chances of getting three tens in a row? Good question. So our engineering challenge for today is to make a model of DNA. And if you want to put together something where you have the actual structure, you can use the printout that we have in on our Patreon page. Or if you want to follow Math Dad's example and do an edible DNA model, you can mm. use licorice and marshmallows. There are lots of different things you can use. And we even did put a link to an origami DNA model that we found online that looks pretty awesome. So there are plenty of possibilities there with their engineering challenge. And then our art prompt for tomorrow is to do wacky Punnett squares. And again, we have a guide there. Yeah, we've got to spend more time on that. We we we'll, we'll, we might we might do a whole week of genetics. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a, a poll on Patreon and see what people want to cover next because we could easily do a week. All right, let's go back to our art showcase and see some more fantastic insect art. So we left off with with this, and now it's time for the litter fly. <gasps> Does it clean up litter? Cleans up litter. Moana, yes, I love it. Bravo. Edward did a fantastic bug that is a death bug and <laughs> has laser eyes. El Ufobo. El Ufobo, a dung beetle. Oh, I love it. It's, it's like an elephant bug. Rashab did an ant bee, an ant bee plus ladybug. It pollinates all types <laughs> of flowers. And then we have a corona bug. Ooh, actual size is, yes. is very small, but very small. But and I have to say, if you didn't have time to check out the gallery on Facebook, we got so many more entries than we have time to show here in the video. This, but one, this one eats trash. Eats trash. We had a lot of really cool Corona bugs that would take care of the coronavirus. Venia. Dangerous animal only lives in very hot climates, and it's venomous. Uh oh. If you get bitten, you can pour water over the cut and it'll wash away the poison. But the good thing about it is that it eats plastic and it composts. I tell you, a bug that eats plastic would be fabulous. Yeah. The Antis T-Rex eats dirt, lives in the forest, and is poisonous. This insect looks like an ant, but it isn't. It makes people happy. Oh, fabulous. Nice, Jake. Fabulous job. The jump stab <gasps> jumps on prey and stabs them. It's <laughs> very aggressive. <laughs> I love the, the 3D insect. I Man. do. I love the 3D insect as well. And then the, the practice with writing it out on the computer. Well done. I'd be terrified of that thing. though. Well, I think it's a cool insect. Allergy bug and a flying ant takes away allergies and motion sickness. <laughs> oh, Graham. Fantastic. The cant eats paper, lives underground, and its wings glow at night. Beautiful. And then Alex, this one was fantastic. My bug is very helpful because it eats nuclear waste and the quantum theory written on it and uses a basket to carry the waste. Isn't that great? It's made of gold. <laughs> yes. The color rainbow beetle brings color to the world. Very nice, Ellie. Great job. And then we have Nathan did a snowman insect that will shovel people's driveways. <laughs> Matt Dad would love this if we lived in a snowy climate. That's right. And then we have a robo bug. Highly protected because it's the only one of its kind. I love it. And a beetle that eats dead trees and recycles things. That's awesome. <laughs> and the cool thing about this one is that there are a lot of real life insects that do just that. The dress helps by pollinating plants and eating flies and mosquitoes. Great job, Paige. And the, the wild dog bug helps the world with coronavirus. I love it. <laughs> A bug that brings joy to the world. Do you want a hug? Isn't that great? Yeah, and the Earth like Bug Zach. by Magnolia. And then we had like opposite colors here with these bugs, which I thought was Almost really like fun. Cat bugs. Yeah. yeah. I like that. A pencil bug can be found <laughs> in trees and was used in old manuscripts. And the monofly makes a mosquito and a butterfly. Great job, Kylie. It's Sam. And a flying centipede. Great job, Sullivan. 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 Good job. 
and a bug that makes plants so they can grow. Oh, Anya, Dr. Kitty Cat that cures job, illnesses. Sean. I love it. <laughs> and a scorpio <gasps> sect. Ooh. Oh, boy. A cross between a scorpion and a bee. It grows 10 times bigger, and he looks like he has a mask. His sting is very deadly, and he glows in the dark. And But he eats spiders and is very quick. He can go 80 miles an hour. Oh, man. Fantastic. And a sanitizer bug that would help to clean things ah. and eat mosquitoes and flies. I love it. Good job. And a bob beetle scares people away from bogs. Love it. A pink bug that re eats red ants and grass. And last but not least, I thought it would be funny to show Math Dad the inspiration. So um, shout out to the Fruited Teacher Life. I saw that inspiration on Instagram and then our attempt to create it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ours, ours are a little less impressive, but many, a little. Many of you came up with even better ones, and we'll end with just a couple of the great engineered engineering oh, elements. tusks and hair. Aren't those great? Yes. So yeah, you guys did ones that were way better than ours, and I loved seeing the gallery of elephants that you guys came up with. <laughs> Bravo. Oh. And this one, <gasps> this one you could actually walk around and it moves. And then last but not least, that was our... Um, painting with a scientist. So thank you for joining us today for this issue of episode of Quarantine Time. We will be back again tomorrow and learning about germs and microbes. And I hope you enjoy this week of biology. And if you would like to have more Science Mom today, I'm going to be back in about 10 to 15 minutes with another art lesson. So the kids, they need to get their art supplies yep, ready. Yep. And get get do, some do, do paints some or some colored pencils. We're going to paint DNA. Oh, that sounds like fun. Yep. Take care and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.